So the last time we uh, were together, we were talking about fluid balance and in particular where we get water from. And you'll remember that one of the places or two sources for water gains, one of the places was from metabolic water, which is a consequence of all of the chemical reactions, in particular cellular respiration. The other source of water is going to be what's called preformed. Okay, so preformed water. Metabolic water was about 200 milliliters per day. This is the remaining 2300 milliliters per day. So about 2300 milliliters per day. Uh, and this preformed water is going to be the water that we ingest. And we can ingest water really from two sources. We can either consume it as uh, food. And I've seen these the number here for food range from uh, about 500 milliliters per day to about 1,500 milliliters per day, so we'll sort of split the difference there a little bit. Our book says about 700 milliliters per day. So the, the water that comes in from food, nice juicy apple that has cells, a lot of that is intracellular food and extracellular food, and that's what you're consuming. Or the hamburger, if it's a nice juicy hamburger, you're consuming that water from all of those cells and from the blood and things like that. And then we can also consume water from beverage or from drink. And that, again, I see a range um, around 1,600 milliliters per day, as low as about 500, as high as 2,000. But uh, about 1,600 milliliters today would be a nice, <coughs> nice average. So you can see here's our 2,300. And the numbers even here are a little bit different. They're saying ingested water is 1,600, or I'm sorry, 1,300 ingested food is about 1,000. So just a little bit of a range there. And then about 300, I said 200 from metabolic activity. So they're saying 2,600 in the figure. I said about 2,500. We're not going to really split hairs here. So that's water that comes in. Now, what if we didn't get rid of water? And we always consume 2,500 milliliters per day. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, we'd like be like um, Baruka. Yeah. Rolls up like a blueberry. <laughs> we'd just fill up with water. We would also leave a lot of metabolic toxins and a lot of ions in the body. And there's a lot of nasty consequences of that. If we don't get rid of potassium, you know what happens? Your yeah, your heart. And in fact, uh, potassium chloride, do you know what potassium chloride is? That's the drug that we use in lethal injection. So potassium would begin to build up, and what it does is you have high potassium levels inside of the extracellular fluid. Normally it's very low in the extracellular fluid, and so now potassium actually can't cross back out, so we never can go through the rest of the action potential in the heart would eventually stop contracting. So we have to balance the fluid that comes in with the fluid that goes out. So we have a variety of water losses that occur on a daily basis as well. And we're going to take water loss, and we're going to break that water loss up into five normal losses. Five normal losses. In these five normal losses, the categories I'm about to give you, I'm going to clarify and I'm going to, I'm going to introduce these under the idea of normal physiological conditions. And so what that means, if these losses are normally occurring under physiological conditions, if we deviate outside of normal physiology, say stress or exercise for the disease pathophysiology, we may alter how water is lost. 
And we may actually alter how water is gauged as well. So this is normal losses that occur under normal physiological conditions. We already know that a lot of water is going to be generated as urine. And so the urinary system and urine excretion, urine excretion is about 1,500 milliliters on a daily basis. We're also going to have water that is absorbed, especially in the large intestine, but not all of it is going to be absorbed out of the food that's being consumed. So some of it gets left in the fecal material as it's produced. And so during elimination, we're going to lose some of the, the water as well. Now this is a much lower amount, about 200 milliliters per day. Every time you breathe out, why can you see your breath during uh, the winter time when it's cold outside? Because the water that's in that breath is actually undergoing uh, a condensation. So we're going to have losses that come from expiration or from respiration, expired losses. And these are about 300 milliliters per day. We're also going to have sweat. Now, when I say sweat, no, remember this was normal physiology. And I already said exercise is not normal physiology. Exercise is a stress physiology. So I'm basically saying right now that all of you are sweaty. And that's true, because you're trying to maintain the acid mantle. You generate a small amount of set sweat. It's called imperceptible sweat. And if you don't exercise, if you don't have a larger... Uh, uh, amount of sweat being produced above and beyond this normal, it's going to be about 100 milliliters per day. So sweat, about 100 milliliters per day. And this is a glandular secretion. This is not the full out sweat gland producing large amounts of sweat during exercise. This is just simply just sort of this slow glandular secretion to cover up the skin to maintain the acid mantle. And so all of you are sweating right now. It's a very low amount, and so it's imperceptible. So we call it imperceptible sweat, about 100 milliliters a day. Now, we also probably need to clarify this just a little bit. This number here, 100 milliliters per day, of imperceptible sweat would be would be at rest at about 20 degrees centigrade for room temperature. So you might actually be sweating a little bit more. Uh, apparently it's about 70 degrees in here right now, which is close to 20 degrees centigrade. But as we get a little bit warmer, if it was maybe 80 degrees in here, you'd sweat a little bit more. And you might actually even notice it. A little bit, you'd be a little bit more cognizant of it. And so that's actually going to be pathophysiology or uh, deviant physiology, so to speak, because it doesn't meet the definition that we're using for this imperceptible sweat, which would be resting at 20 degrees centigrade. Would you still have imperceptible sweat? So you, you just ask, would you still produce sweat if you were really cold all the time? Yeah, you're like really cold. Yes, you still do. You actually still produce a small amount of sweat. So standing out at the bus stop in Minnesota on a cold winter's morning, it would still be sweating and it would still be cold. And yes. All right. Now the last, um, the last type of water loss is something that you're familiar with, but you probably don't know its name. The name is cans. The name is cutaneous transpiration. Cutaneous transpiration. And cutaneous transpiration is about 400 milliliters per day. Now it's cutaneous, and so it's actually related to the skin as well. Sweat 
is a glandular secretion. Sweat comes from glands, right? From the things that we call sweat glands. Cutaneous transportate transportate <laughs> transpiration, cutaneous transpiration is actually going to be this diffusion of fluid that's directly through the skin, that is not through a sweat gland, which is coming through the skin. So no sweat gland involved. This cutaneous transpiration is considered to be an evaporative loss. And I said that you are already probably familiar with it. And it doesn't work well on these tables with the benches in uh, the lab benches in Miller 212. You put your hand down there and you pick your hand up and leave the handprint left over and then sort that dissolves away. That's because of cutaneous transpiration. So it's evaporating. And the reason that your handprint gets left over there on the table is not really because of your hand, it's because the water that's coming out through cutaneous transpiration all across your body. You could throw your whole body up there and do a, I don't know, cutaneous transpiration angel. <laughs> but the water just simply shows up because it's collecting on a surface that's a lot cooler. And so it causes that what really is coming off of your skin closer to a gas phase as more of a liquid. Because although there are five main losses, and I said that this is what it would look like under normal physiology. So what are some non-typical losses? What are some examples of non-typical losses? In other words, what are some ways that we can lose water that we normally don't lose water through? Oh, you said crying? No, I cry all the time. No, I'm just kidding, I don't. Crying's for losers. Crying would actually be a sort of a form of this pathophysiological or non typical loss. So we're going to call these pathophysiological losses. I guess crying is not exactly a pathophysiological condition. It's more of an emotional deviation from normal physiology. But yeah, tears. A small amount could come out in tears. But really what we're talking about here are things like bleeding or vomiting. <laughs> Wow, I never. Dr. Dr. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's very true. <laughs> no, I can't even spell it. <laughs> diarrhea. Yes, diarrhea would be another pathophysiological loss. <laughs> I can't believe how excited everybody just got about. Just got over diarrhea. It's not exciting to have. <laughs> <laughs> so bleeding, vomiting, and yes, diarrhea. Now even the normal losses and the non-normal losses, just losses of water in general, as we've already sort of alluded to, are going to be affected by external conditions or external variables. So <clears throat> sweating and consumption of food, these losses, and even to a certain degree some of the gains are going to be affected by physical activity levels. <coughs> They're going to be affected by temperature or affected by the relative air humidity.
increased physical activity increases internal temperature. Temperature of the environment causes you to have to sweat more because you're influenced in taking in more heat by the increase in temperature. And then humidity, just the wetness of the air, obviously can cause higher rate of perspiration. Um, that's a really great question. It depends on the amount of exercise. And it could be as much as 500 milliliters an hour up to liters an hour. Um, excessively high perspiration is diaphoresis. And you, there, I mean, some of you, you go out and you go out and you on and sweat just a little bit. And then, like others of you go out and like you come back and you're just like totally drenched and it looks like you must have fell in the cesspool down the road, but you just have excessive sweating like a pig sweat. So, I mean, exercise. Most most people, you give two individuals, one who exhibits diaphoresis and one who doesn't. You give them the exact same conditions and the exact same physical activity level, and. Sweating is totally different. Does everybody have all of this? Does your um, hydration affect like your regularity to the bathroom? Is that not like like your feet use and stuff like that? Or that's like a weird question. Yeah. Like being hydrated, they say like being hydrated. Is oh yeah, I mean absolutely. It's, you want to make your business in the bathroom more comfortable? <laughs> I went into a bathroom once. <laughs> it was a, it, it, like, it sounds like a bad joke, but it really happened. I went into a bathroom and this guy, this guy was sitting there and he just started going, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> And this other guy, it must have been a friend who's like two or three stalls down, and he just goes, Tom, you need to mo drink more water. <laughs> I just washed my hands and left. <laughs> the one was normal losses, the two was non typical losses, three was lost. Yes, okay, I'm sorry. Losses affected by external conditions. See, you got me thinking about. <laughs> bathroom situations now and I'm just getting totally off here. <laughs> this isn't even the right word. <laughs> okay, so we're now going to talk a little bit about loss sensation. Okay, so loss sensation. <laughs> Now, it shouldn't really surprise you that sometimes we know when losses are occurring, <clears throat> like when you're in the bathroom, hopefully you know that you're urinating. <laughs> and then sometimes losses occur without your knowledge. So the sensation of loss is going to come into those two categories. Uh, we're going to start here with the insensible water loss. Okay, so this cannot be sensed. You don't know that it's occurring, or at least not usually, unless you're being told that it's happening and then you can become conscious of it. So you're not conscious of this, these types of losses. Obviously, the cutaneous transpiration, I'm just going to abbreviate that as cut trans cutaneous transpiration, up until this point, you probably didn't really understand what that was. But that's just simply cutaneous transpiration, water diffusing directly through the skin, not through a sweat gland. Whenever you breathe, Breathing is considered a um, insensible water loss. And then last is going to be what we would call basal level sweat production. 
that very low volume of sweat that's being generated to help maintain things like the acid We'll pick up with sensible water loss on Wednesday.